Okay. Malachi chapter 3, verse number 6. The Bible says this. This is a text of Scripture that uh, we're going to kind of use as a springboard for the rest of the message. And I'm going to give you more context to it in just a few moments, but I just want to read it. I think the verse itself, by itself, stands out and makes a clear statement. Malachi chapter 3, verse 6 says, For I am the Lord, I change not. Amen. I think we can allow that opening phrase to stand on its own. Now, when we, when we talk about God not changing, we need to understand a little more clearly what is meant by this notion of change. Because there are some things about God that just cannot change. Uh, God is omnipresent. That is, God is able to look at the world like this and is, doesn't have to be on the other side in order to figure out what the other side's doing. He can be over here and know what's going on over here. Yeah. I don't like the definition of God is everywhere at, at once. That sounds almost uh, like pantheism, that God is everything. But it's almost like God, because God is bigger than you and I, and God is bigger than the world in which we live in, and he just kind of holds it in his hand and looks at it and says, yeah, I created that. Yeah. That doesn't change about God. Nothing about his omnipresence, if you will, changes. He is omniscient. That is, he is full of all knowledge. God knows everything about you, and believe it or not, he still loves you. Amen. There are some things about God that just don't change. Now, there are some things that, by God's grace, do change. And over the course of this message, Lord willing, you will be blessed by some of the things that have changed. You say, it sounds blasphemous, preacher. You're saying that God's changed. I didn't say that. I started off with a verse that makes a declarative statement. I am the Lord, I change not. Amen. I'm not going to change that verse. I'm not going to change anything about that verse. In fact, if you look at verse 5, notice it says, And I will come near to you to judgment, and I will be a swift witness against the sorcerers, and against the adulterers, and against the false swearers, and against those that oppress the hireling in his wages, the widow, the fatherless, and, what, and that turn aside the stranger from his right, and fear not me, saith the Lord of hosts. In other words, in verse 5, he's talking about how he, God, is trustworthy in his word. He's saying, I'm going to be a swift witness against. That means it's going to be my word against them. And then he says, I change not. So there's one thing we can say about God that does not change. He always tells the truth. Amen. Amen. But by way of introduction this morning, have you ever heard somebody say that the God of the Old Testament is patently different from the God of the New Testament? That the God of the Old Testament is the, quote, smiting God while the God of the New Testament is the loving God. Perhaps maybe you've read through your Bible and come to a conclusion that the severity of the Old Testament God is different from the grace and the love of the New Testament God. As our president fondly likes to say, let me make it clear, God has not changed. Amen. The God that you and I serve is not, if you will, bipolar. That is, he's not severe, and unmerciful for 2,000 years of Old Testament history, and all of a sudden loving and merciful in the New Testament. I submit to you that he's severe now, he can be unmerciful now, and he can be loving and merciful at the, all the same time. In fact, I would argue that the God of the Old Testament is just as passionate and just as merciful and just as grace-extending as he is in the New Testament. We need not diagnose God as having a medical condition to try to find an answer. God is the same. He has never changed. Now let me add this caveat. While his dealing with man can change from economy to economy, God's person does not change. Amen. 
This morning, I'd like to offer three Old Testament accounts that prove beyond any shadow of a doubt that the God of the Old Testament is just as merciful and just as gracious as he is in the New Testament. The title of the message this morning is simply, The Bipolar God. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you for the opportunity this morning to be in your house. We thank you for these folks who have come out. Father, there are a whole host of folks uh, that are not here today. And Lord, for whatever reason, Lord, whether there be some sickness or maybe some folks are taking a last minute vacation or maybe folks are coming in, Lord, we just pray that you'd be with them, Father. Keep them safe. Lord, bring them back to us safely. And Father, we pray that you would help us, Lord, for the next few moments to be attentive to this message. Father, help us to focus our minds and our hearts upon what you would want us to hear this morning. And Father, we'll be careful to give you all the praise and all the honor, for it's in Jesus Christ's name we ask it. Amen. The question this morning is, God bipolar? Is God bipolar? Well, the short and concise answer to that is, no. See, I find it interesting that when man, and that would mean you and me, that when man cannot comprehend something like God, that instead of digging a bit deeper to find the answer, man seeks to excuse it with a man-made concoction like God must be some sort of bipolar God. God declares without equivocation that I am the Lord, I change not. That is, everything about God's character that was true in the Old Testament is just as true of God in the New Testament. Nothing changed. Nothing about God has ever, will ever, and can ever change. God, if you will, is the constant, constant. And by the way, if God's nature did change, let me just say this, if God's nature did change and his character subject to the whims of circumstances like you and I are subject to the whims of circumstances, then that would call into question his very trustworthiness. And folks, I am not going to stand up here as a preacher of the Word of God and say that I am going to call into question God's trustworthiness. Because one day I'm going to stand before him and he's going to say, what did you say about my trustworthiness? <laughs> you see, I'm going to say to you today that I believe that he is trustworthy. What I believe happens is man is unable to understand him. Now, because man is unable to understand him doesn't mean I have to now throw a medical term at God and say, well, that explains it. Or, well, the reason why God's like that is because, well, this or that or the other thing. Man, let me just make it very plain. God's character is consistent. Amen. Yours isn't. That's right. In fact, you so hard try to make God like you that you'll bring him down to your level to do it. And I've got news for you. Though you might be created originally in the image of God, but lost it during Adam's fall, you are not going to make God out of your own image, my friend. God is above you. He's not like you. In fact, he says in Isaiah, he says, My ways are not your ways, saith the Lord, for my thoughts are not your thoughts, and my ways are not your ways. So no, God is not some bipolar God who has these mood swings from time to time and just kind of goes here and goes there and I'm this one day and I'm, this not, I'm not this the next day. Now, let me also say this. While it's true that God is not bipolar and while it is true that God's character in all of its essence has not changed and will not change, God's dealing with man can change. I'll give you an example. If you've read Genesis 1 through 3, you're going to have to notice that God dealt with Adam differently before the fall than he did after the fall. That's right. Our relationship was very deep before the fall, and then the fall happened, and now God's relationship with Adam, and then by extension, man, is patently different. Yes. So there's no doubt that God's dealing with man from an economy to an economy, that is, from dispensation to dispensation, can change from time to time. There's no doubt about that, and we'll, we'll see that here in just a few moments, especially in our last point. But that has nothing to do about God's grace. Amen. 
You see, though I am a staunch dispensationalist, and for those of you that are not equating with that word, you don't have to worry about it. It just means an economy of time that someone is a steward over. Uh, God is still gracious from the first dispensation, which would be in the garden, to the very last dispensation, which would be eternity proper. Yeah. I believe that the grace extends all the way through there. And I'm going to show that to you in just a few moments. But there is a basic misunderstanding. And it all boils down to this basic misunderstanding of God. That is, some would read the Old Testament and conclude that the God of the Old Testament is not as gracious as the God revealed in the New Testament. The implication is that they must be two different gods. Now, they may not say it like that. But it would seem to be implied that there's this smiting God over there in the Old Testament and then there's this loving God who turns a blind eye to sin. And may I say, that's not the God I serve. That's right. the, or in the least, if you will, God is somehow bipolar and of two different mindsets from day to day. And may I say that both are premised upon a basic misunderstanding of God. And allow me to give you at least three Old Testament accounts that show a consistency between the God of the Old Testament and a God of the New Testament. Take your Bibles, if you will. We're going to look at several verses. Look at Genesis chapter 17. This should be pretty simple because it's the first book in your Bible. Genesis chapter 17. Now, I want you to look at all these passages with me. This is kind of a Bible study sermon this morning. Probably something that would be a little more befitting for a Sunday evening sermon. But let me just show you a few things here by way of introduction. In Genesis chapter 17, we have, if you will, a renewed covenant with Abraham. And in verse number 14, something is added to this covenant with Abraham that is actually began in Genesis chapter 12, reinstated in Genesis 15, the Abrahamic covenant, and then reissued here in Genesis 17, but with this addition. Notice in verse number 9 of Genesis 17, And God said unto Abraham, Thou shalt keep my covenant, therefore, thou and thy seed after thee in their generations. This is my covenant which ye shall keep between me and you and thy seed after thee. Now notice this. Every man-child among you shall be, everyone say it. And ye shall circumcise the flesh of your foreskin, and it shall be a token of the covenant betwixt or between me and you. And he that is eight days old, and by the way, the traditional Jews still circumcise their young men on the eighth day, shall be circumcised among you, every man-child in your generations, he that is born in the house or bought with money of any stranger, which is not of thy seed. He that is born in thy house and he that is brought with money must needs be circumcised, and my covenant shall be in your flesh for an everlasting covenant. Verse 14. And the uncircumcised man-child, whose flesh of his foreskin is not circumcised, that soul shall be cut off from his people. He hath broken my covenant. Now, I'm going to elaborate just how important this doctrine of circumcision is to the Old Testament Jew in just a second. But let me just say something to you. This covenant of circumcision was extremely important for the Jewish nation to recognize. Not just for the sake of cleanliness and all the other things that the book of Leviticus would talk about, but by the very words of the Lord who says, this is a token, verse 11, of the covenant between you and me. In other words, this is a physical, physical token of the covenant between you and me. This law of circumcision was clear. Basically, God said, either get circumcised or risk being cut off from Israel and potentially die. Now, I want you to go over to Exodus chapter 4 and notice the severity of not keeping this. Exodus chapter 4 and look at verses 24 and following. Now, there's some theological misunderstanding here. Some people say that God was about to kill Moses. Some people say that God was about to kill his child. Either way, it was serious, okay? Look at Exodus chapter 4, verse number 24. Moses, of course, had not 
circumcise this child. In verse 24, it says this in Exodus 4, And it came to pass by the way in the end that the Lord met him and sought to kill him. That would be, I believe, Moses. Then Zipporah took a sharp stone, cut off the foreskin of her son, and cast it at his feet, Moses' feet, and said, Surely a bloody husband art thou to me. By the way, what an image, amen? <laughs> and verse 26, so, we, so let him go. Then she said, A bloody husband art thou because of the circumcision. Now here's my point. Whether this was God about to kill Moses for not keeping the covenant with his child, or God was going to kill the child, either way, understand this is really important for God. God was going to either kill Moses or kill the child for not keeping the token of the covenant between me and you. Now, can we say that God takes this seriously? Yes. That if you are going to keep this covenant, you are going to get cut off and potentially die. Can we all agree? Amen. Go to Joshua chapter 5. Joshua chapter 5. And I want you to notice what happens here when the children of Israel cross over into the into the land flowing with milk and honey. John, Joshua chapter 5 and verse number 2. The Bible says this, At that time the Lord said unto Joshua, Make these sharp knives and circumcise again the children of Israel the second time. Boy, I'd think the first time would be the best one. Amen. Look at verse 3. And Joshua made him sharp knives and circumcised the children of Israel at the hill of the foreskins. Verse 4. And this is the cause why Joshua did circumcise. Now catch this. All the people that came out of Egypt that were males, even all the men of war died in the wilderness, by the way. Remember, God says, for those of you that are 20 and over, you guys have been murmuring, you're complaining, you, I provide, you guys still murmur, I provide again, you still murmur, I'm sick of hearing it, you're dead. You're all going to die in this wilderness. But those of you that are 20 and under, I'm going to allow to go into, this, into the land of promise. Those guys were in the wilderness, had not been circumcised for almost 20 years, some of them. So now they're coming under Joshua's leadership. And in verse 5 it says, Now all the people that came out were circumcised, that is, out of Egypt. But all the people that were born in the wilderness by the way as they came forth out of Egypt, they, they had not circumcised. For the children of Israel walked 40 years in the wilderness till all the people that were men of war which came out of Egypt were consumed because they obeyed not the voice of the Lord unto whom the Lord swore that he would uh, not show them the land which the Lord swore unto their fathers that he would give us a land that floweth with milk and honey. Guess what? Joshua gets the men, circumcises all those adult men and some of the children and takes care of it. Here's my point. The God of the Old Testament, who is supposedly ungracious and unmerciful, and is a, absolutely the stark contrast of the God of the New Testament, allowed an entire generation to wander in the wilderness without fulfilling this basic ordinance without having one sore throat. That's right. Isn't that something? Amen. Now, you, you say, what do you call that? I call that grace in the Old Testament. Amen. I call that an example of God, if you will, saying, you know what? They're flesh, they're dingbats, and, and guess what? It doesn't matter. Before they get into that promised land under Joshua's leadership, they're going to get circumcised. They may not like it, but it's going to happen. Now, here's my point. Grace. Before Matthew's gospel. Let me give you number two. Look at Leviticus chapter 20. Leviticus chapter 20. You say, where's this all going? You just give me a moment here. Let me build this thing up to some sort of crescendo. Leviticus chapter 20. For those of you that like music terms. Leviticus chapter 20. Look at verse 10. Notice what it says. Leviticus chapter 20, verse 10. And the man that committeth adultery with another man's wife, even he that committeth adultery with his neighbor's wife, the adulterer and the adulteress shall surely be put to death. Boy, the Muslims are following that one to tell you. Amen. And the man that lieth with his father's wife hath uncovered his father's nakedness. Both of them shall surely be put to death. Their blood shall be upon them. And if a man lie with his daughter-in-law, both of them shall surely be put to death. They have wrought confusion. Their blood shall be upon them. And, and so on and so forth. Verse 10 is what I want you to center your attention on. The man that committeth adultery with another man's wife. Even he that committeth adultery with his neighbor's wife. The adulterer 
and the adulteress, why? Because it takes two to tangle, my friends, shall surely be put to death. The Old Testament law demanded that if a man and a woman who were not faithfully wed got together were to be killed. Aren't you glad you don't live under an Old Testament theocracy? Everyone say amen. Every one of you be dead this morning. Now look over here. Numbers chapter 25. Numbers chapter 35. Numbers chapter 35. Numbers chapter 35. Look at verse 31. Numbers chapter 35, verse 31. Moreover, Numbers 35, verse 31. Moreover, ye shall take no satisfaction for the life of a murderer, which is guilty of death, but he shall be surely put to death. Now, if we in the United States would just enforce that, uh, we might be able to eliminate crime a little quicker. Amen? I didn't say to altogether, but I think we'd probably eliminate crime a little better than the way it is going right now. But notice what, what, the, uh, what Moses says. Take no satisfaction. That is, we are not to allow a murderer who is guilty of committing murderer, murder, excuse me, to live. Now, I want you to apply that to 2 Samuel chapter 12. 2 Samuel chapter 12. And you have a king sitting on a throne who sat there for a while and thought he got away with two things that the Old Testament said you were to get killed for. And those two things is murder and adultery. The Old Testament king, of course, is David, the apple of God's eye, ironically, who is sitting on the throne. I don't know how long uh, the time had elapsed between the adultery with Bathsheba and the killing of Bathsheba's husband Uriah, but it didn't matter how long it, it took because God knew what was going on. And God sent a Baptist preacher, I'm not saying he was a Baptist preacher, but God sent someone just as cantankerous as a Baptist to go confront David and say to him, Thou art the man. Yeah. David was both a murderer because he was complicit in Uriah's death and an adulterer. And by the way, Bathsheba was an adulteress. That's right. The law demanded action. You read it in both Leviticus and Numbers. Adulterers and adulteresses, put them to death. Murderers, put them to death. Neither David nor Bathsheba were put to death. That's right. You say, what's that? God's grace in the Old Testament before the New Testament? Amen. You say, wait a minute though. He's an unrelenting God. He's a smiting God. Oh sure, I can give you some verses on those. But here's an example of grace. Amen. Let me put it this way. They deserved what their sin penalty had for them. But God overlooked it. You say, how does, that, how does that apply? Give me a few minutes. Go to Exodus chapter 16. Go to Exodus chapter 16. I'm going to give you a third one. We'll put it all together when we get to that fourth account. Exodus chapter 16. Look at verse 23. This is something here that some of you have uh, kind of misunderstood as well. But I want you to look at verse 22 first. Exodus 16, verse 22. Verse 22, And it came to pass that on the sixth day they gathered twice as much bread, two omers for one man, and all the rulers of the congregation came and told Moses. Now, of course, this is uh, the manna falling from heaven. And you know that on the sixth day they were supposed to gather two as times as much, so they didn't have to go out on the Sabbath and gather that food, right? All right. Verse 23, And he said unto them, This is that which the Lord had said, Tomorrow is the rest of the holy Sabbath unto the Lord. Bake that which ye shall, uh, bake that which ye will bake today, and seethe that ye will seethe, and that which remaineth overlay up for you to be kept until the morning. Verse 25, And Moses says, Eat that today, for today is a Sabbath day unto the Lord. Today ye shall not find it in the field. Six days ye shall gather it, but on the seventh day, which is the Sabbath, in it there shall be none. So God didn't even work on that day. God didn't even, God didn't even bother performing a miracle. God, if God didn't bother breaking the bread, then neither should you. Alright? Now, look at Numbers chapter 15. Numbers chapter 15. Keep that in mind in, the, in, in Exodus. Numbers 15. 
I'm trying to build to intensity here. Look at, look at Numbers 15. And look at verses 32 and following. Numbers 15. Verses 32. And I hope you're all right with this Bible thing this morning. Amen. Looking at the Bible. We're good with that. You don't want to come up here and just listen to every blind thing I say. You want to see the Bible for it. Look at verse 32. And while the children of Israel were in the wilderness, they found a man that gathered sticks upon the Sabbath day. Now we know that that's a holy convocation unto the Lord. Amen. Yeah. All right. Here it goes. And they that found him gathered sticks, brought him unto Moses and Aaron and unto all the congregation. And they put him in inward because it was not declared what would be done to him. And the Lord said unto Moses, The man shall be surely put to death. All the congregation shall stone him with stones without the camp. And by the way, this isn't just some guy being run out of camp with a bunch of pebbles. This is not a good way to die. Amen. This is like Paul being rocked to sleep over there in the book of Acts. Verse 36. And all the congregation brought him without the camp and stoned him with stones. And he died as the Lord commanded Moses. Now there's your Old Testament God that you're all familiar with. Amen. The God that doesn't turn a blind eye to that stuff says, All right, you broke it. That's it. You're done. You're dead. Yet, a peculiar thing happens in the book of Joshua. A very peculiar thing. Right around Joshua 6. See, the Jews had to march around a city called Jericho. <laughs> Once for six days. But interestingly, according to Joshua chapter 6, verse numbers 12 through 15, on the seventh day, which is the... They were to march around the city seven times. Now, some of the conservative estimates that I read about marching around Jericho was that, the, that marching around from the front gate all the way around back to the front gate was about two mile radius. Let's say they did that seven times. That's 14 miles of travel in one day, but on the one day that a half mile would have killed you. Wait a minute. On the one day that picking up sticks would kill you. No one was stoned. No one was reprimanded. In fact, they received the victory in that Jericho was delivered unto them. Amen. On the Sabbath, look up here, they labored on it. Yeah. Do you remember when uh, the disciples in, 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 the, in, the, in the Gospels were picking up some corn and stuff on the Sabbath? Yeah. And, and the, the, the Pharisees got all bent out of shape about it. And say, hey, the Sabbath, you know, and the Lord says, how, which one of you have an ox, you know, wouldn't pick him up out of the hole on the Sabbath day and all that. And he says, same thing with these guys. Listen, Jesus was radical in that way. Yeah. And here we are thinking, well, the Sabbath day is mainly for rest. Now, true, it's in, it, for the Old Testament saint, it was rest. Guess what? Your rest is found in Christ. Amen. That's who you rest in. You don't keep it the same way. And by the way, Joshua chapter 6 and, and, and Matthew chapter 18 give us the implication that things were a-changing. Yeah. Things were a-changing. Now you say, what is that an example of in Joshua? It's an example of a God of grace in the Old Testament, clear and simple. Yeah. He didn't kill him. I'm going to give you one more. Look at Matthew chapter 15. We'll close here. This one hopefully will be a blessing. The other ones are just fillers. Matthew 15. I want you to look at verses 22 and following. This is some good stuff. There's a whole message I've preached on this particular passage that I can't get into today. Start at verse 21. Matthew 15, verse 21. We'll end here. Then Jesus went thence and departed into the coast of Tyre and Sidon. And behold... A woman of Canaan, uh, uh, look up here, is a Canaanite a Jew? No. No, okay. Let's, look, let's go look back at the word. Came out of the same coast and cried unto him, that's Jesus saying, Have mercy on me, O Lord, thou son of David. My daughter is grievously vexed with the devil. But he answered her not a word. And his disciples came and besought him, saying, Send her away, for she crieth after us. But he answered and said, I am not sent by the way, he wasn't talking to her here. <laughs> he was talking to his disciples who was asking Christ to take this woman away and says to the disciples, I am not sent 
but unto the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Then came she and worshipped him, saying, Lord, help me. But he answered and said, now I would not have answered this way, <laughs> okay, but your sensitive, gracious, merciful, all-loving, Joel Osteeny, touchy-feely Savior said this, it is not meat to take the children's bread and cast it to dogs. Oh. I would not, I think that's a bad translation. <laughs> I, I think maybe another translation might render that better. No, that's, that's pretty rough talk. And she said, truth? Truth, Lord? And then she says, yet the dogs eat of the crumbs which fall from their master's table. Then Jesus answered and said unto her, O woman, great is thy faith. Be it unto thee, even as thou wilt. And her daughter was made whole from that very hour. Let me give you a couple things about this passage before I get into the main part of it here. There's some great lessons here on prayer. She, she is begging God in verse 22, Have mercy on me, O Lord, thou son of David. My daughter is grievously vexed with the devil. She's not even coming for herself. She's coming for somebody else. She is, if you will, she is offering supplication for somebody else. She is interceding for her daughter. Verse 23, But he answered her not a word, and that's where most of you stop praying. Amen. I don't get an answer from God, then I won't take it to God. But he answered her not a word. And then he insults her, implying, I am not sent unto the lost, uh, I am not sent but unto the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Then she came and worshipped him after he said no. Amen, amen, amen. amen. She worshipped him. How many would you feel like you need to worship him after God just told you no? And then after God just said, I didn't come for you, I came for the circumcised. I didn't come for you. And then not only that, she comes and worships him. And in response to that worship, he then says, you're a dog. Yeah. By the way, that has a double whammy. There's a double implication there. I think most of the scholars would agree with that. And who cares if they agree with me? That's what it is. <laughs> There's an implication there that she is a dog and her people are dogs. Yeah. Guess what? She agreed with it. Truth, Lord. <laughs> oh, man. Yet the dogs eat of the crumbs which fall from their master's table and all of a sudden the Savior's heart sinks. And says, man, you are a woman that is full of faith. Amen. You want your daughter healed? It's going to happen right now. And she went away joyful. Now, here's, here's the important thing. You say, why did Jesus say in verse 24, I am not sent but unto the lost sheep of the house of Israel? Because that was the mandate. Look at Matthew 10. Look at Matthew 10. And here's where a lot of my dispensationalism comes in. Economy from economy. The Lord cho chooses all of his disciples in chapter 10 of Matthew, verses 1, all the way to verse 4. Judas Iscariot is the last name there. There are 12 disciples. By the way, are they all Jewish? They're all Jewish. Verse 5. These 12 sent Jesus forth and commanded them, saying, Go not into the way of the Gentiles, and into any city of the Samaritans enter not. But go rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. And as you go, preach, saying, The kingdom of heaven is at hand. And do this. Heal the sick, cleanse the lepers, raise the dead, cast out devils, freely receive, freely give. Now here's where the Pentecostals get it wrong. They take the kingdom gospel, apply it in the New Testament, and say that's exactly what happens. I'm just telling you, dispensationally, from economy to economy, God is dealing here with a bunch of Jews and a Jewish gospel where Jesus Christ is going to rule and reign on a rod of iron on a throne, and this is what they're supposed to tell Israelites. The kingdom of heaven is at hand, and then, because Jews require a sign, everything that's going to follow your gospel is going to be a sign. Isn't that right? So all the signs are going to follow, which is heal the sick, cleanse the lepers, raise the dead, cast out freely. Guess what? How do you do that in the New Testament and walk by faith and not by sight? Yeah. 
You, you, you can't, if you preach that right now, that exact same gospel that was meant to the Jew first, comma, then to the Greeks, you've got a problem. You say, why? God's not dealing with this economy right now. He's dealing with another economy. Amen. By the way, by the way, didn't God just show a distinction here? Yep. He says, only go to the Jews. That's a distinction. Guess what? Galatians 4 says, there's neither bond nor free, Jew nor Greek, right. Jew or Gentile, for we're all one in Christ Jesus. Can't we all notice a difference? Oh. Amen. All notice a difference in that? Yep. By the way, this great commission was only locally. Yes. Jewish commission. By the time Jesus rises from the dead, in Matthew 20, he says, Go ye into all the world yep. and preach the gospel. Amen. But guess what? Even with this commission, crumbs from the table fell on some Gentiles. The woman at the well. Yep. The Canaanite woman in Matthew 15. One of the centurions. Little crumbs would fall because there was so much on the table of bounty that they'd fall over onto the floor and the Canaanites. Now, this woman in, in Matthew 15 was a Canaanite. Jesus Christ and his disciples were sent to the lost sheep of the house of Israel, not the Gentile dogs. But he ministered nevertheless. Now, I'm going to ask for a little bit of participation this morning. I know this is very unbaptist-like. But I want to ask for a little raise of hand. How many of you, except for Scott Kodish, so you can keep your hand down. How many of you are 100% Jewish? Raise your hand. Okay. How many of you are Gentiles? Raise your hand. You're only one of two. <laughs> You're either a Jew or a Gentile, right? It wasn't a trick question. Now, because you're all Jews, no, you're all Gentiles, aren't you glad he had a little grace on a Canaanite woman? Amen. <laughs> aren't you glad he had a little grace on a Canaanite woman? Because guess what? He wasn't preaching exclusively to the Jews at this moment. He was letting some of his crumbs fall onto the floor and letting you and I grab a little bit. Now he focuses all that back in the book of Acts. Everything now, gospel transitions from the Jews, goes to the Gentiles. Now there's no distinction, bond or free, all that kind of stuff that Paul writes about in Galatians. But this is a bonus. Because this allows you to get in on this. You see, because Paul said something very interesting in Romans chapter 1, verse 16, one of my favorite verses. For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth. And then notice the chronology. To the Jew first, comma, and also to the Greeks or the Gentiles. So the order, if you will, was the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Now it's to you. Now here's how all this works. You come to the Lord. You've broken Sabbaths, even though there is no Sabbath to break in the same sense. But you've broken holy days to God. You've not, you show no identity with Him with the covenant. You're an adulterer an adulteress at heart. Maybe you haven't committed those things physically, but at heart. And you are guilty as guilty can be. And you know you're guilty. You don't need me to convince you that for all have sinned and come short of the God. You know you're a sinner. And you come before a righteous God and say, listen, I want in. Because I know you can take care of my issue. Guess what? Some crumbs fall and you get in. Now here's my point. If God can show that grace in the Old Testament, He is most definitely showing that grace now. You know what I'm looking at this morning? <laughs> and forgive me for the 
for the wording. I'm looking at a bunch of dogs that got in on the kingdom. Amen. Now you say, I'm not, listen, look at yourself as lowly as possible <laughs> and understand that you got in on something. And you ought to be blessed. Amen. God's not bipolar. God doesn't have one position tomorrow and another position today. God extended grace from Genesis 1 to Revelation 22 and everywhere in between. Amen. And if you can't find it, it's because you're blinder than a snow goose in a snowstorm. <laughs> Folks, it's there. And you know what I'm even more happy about? is that grace is just as efficacious and giving today. Amen. Right now, right. in October of 2014. You say, Preacher, I'm not a murderer and adulteress like David and Bathsheba. Obviously, I've got no Sabbath that I've broken because there's no Sabbath in the same sense. We're not under a theocracy. And uh, I'm not marching around no city <laughs> for the walls to come tumbling down. So what's my situation? Well, are you a sinner? Because if you are, that's, where, that's your way in. Amen. Now one of the things I want to make very clear is this. God doesn't love your sin. He loathes it. That's why you can't get to heaven without them being forgiven. He loathes them. And let me further say, He doesn't love the sinner who's in his sin. Right. Now, I know we like to say that God hates the sin but loves the sinner. I don't know if that's necessarily true. I think that God loathes the sinner who is in his sin. Yeah. But at the same time, the sinner who's in his sin can still have grace imparted to that individual if they would simply come humbly to a cross and say, Yeah, I'm a sinner. Let me give you a test. I did this in our Sunday school last week and I've done it before in, in church. You take, the other, you take that Ten Commandments. Some people today say, well, you know, I want to keep the Ten Commandments. Well, first of all, you're not going to do that. <laughs> you've already messed the first five up and there's no doubt you've probably messed the latter five up. But let's just say the Ten Commandments is your criteria. Let's say that Jesus would allow you into heaven based upon keeping those Ten Commandments. Let's just say that. Let's do a test. Exodus chapter 20 says, Thou shalt bear false witness. How many of you can just in your own mind, don't have to raise your hand, how many of you ever lied a lie? You ever lied? I mean a small one, medium sized one, big one? It doesn't matter how big, small, medium it is. A lie is a lie. So that means according to the Bible you're a liar. <laughs> right? The Bible says, Thou shalt not steal. You ever stole something? You see, when you think of stealing, you're thinking of robbing a piggy bank or somebody's money or whatever that case is. Listen, it could be anything. That's right. Stealing is stealing. It doesn't have to be just a pencil off a person's desk. You ever stole an identity? You ever stole this? You ever, I mean, there's all kinds of stuff. Something tells me you've probably stolen something. Somewhere. So then you're a lying thief. The Bible says... Thou shalt not commit adultery. Okay, let's say you, you haven't committed adultery. Jesus adds to that and says, if you committed adultery in your heart, you're just as guilty. Right. You ever, men, you ever looked at a woman in your heart and lusted? Ladies, you ever looked at a man and lusted in your heart? I think so. Then by your own admission and according to your own standard of rule, you're a lying, thieving, adulterous at heart. Now, you take those, just those three out of ten, and you die and stand before God, and He's going to let you in? And here's what you do. Well, He's a good God, and He'll overlook it. If He's good, He won't overlook it. That's right. You ever thought about that? Yeah. If He's good, then He won't overlook it. Yeah. The only way He'll overlook it is if they're not there. You say, how, how is that possible? Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and the blood of Christ wipes away those sins. 
It's as simple as that. You say, oh, it can't be that simple. It's that simple. Yeah. It's that simple. You see, if we use your criteria of the Ten Commandments, three of them knock you out of the ballpark. Yeah. Three of them. Now, I got news for you. The God of the Old Testament is just as sickened of sin then as he is now. Amen. And all the things that I read about God in the book of Revelation is all New Testament. And I read about a thing called a lake of fire. I read about a thing called the second death. I read about fire and brimstone. That's all New Testament. That's all New Testament. Folks, something tells me God's still in the business of disliking sin. Nothing has changed. How about your relationship with Him? If you're here this morning and you're not saved, you've got to get saved. You say, how do I get saved? You know you're a sinner? Okay, good. Then you better make sure you have a payment for that sin. Because you're not paying for it. You couldn't pay for it with a million dollars. You couldn't pay with it. If you had all the money in Fort Knox, God's not interested in that money. You say, why? He owns it anyway. You say, well, I'll, I'll, uh, I'll, I'll go to church every Sunday. No, you'll get bored. Look at half the people in here today. You guys are already bored, and the other half didn't even make it to church. <laughs> you say, well, uh, I'll read my Bible through five times. Well, let me tell you something right now. I've read my Bible through a whole bunch of times, and there's still things in there that I scratch my head and say, I still don't know what that means. Amen. I know enough of it to scare me, <laughs> but, but there's some of it in there I still don't know. I, I read something to you this morning. I don't know whether it was Moses who was in die or his kid. I, you, you probably have an opinion. I, I, don't, I don't know. I'm just saying there's some things I don't understand, but there's enough in there that I do understand. You, you, you know you're a sinner? All right. Well, there it is right there. <laughs> the only payment for your sin is going to be Jesus Christ. What an offense to God. What an offense to God. If, if the Father would send His only begotten Son to live a perfect life for you, Follow the Ten Commandments. Keep the golden rule. Do all the things that you think down here are the requirements for getting to heaven. Do all those things. Not look at a woman and lust in his heart. Never utter a lie. Never think a perverse thought. He do all those things because he's not only 100% man, but he's 100% God. Do all those things, then suffer the reproach of the cross all for you if you could do it some other way. What an offense to God. What an offense to God. That you think you can do it some other way and God went through all that with his son for you, but you think you can give to charity. Yes. Who are you kidding, man? <laughs> you're not kidding me, and you're not kidding God. Let's get serious about it.